All right. Good morning, church. How we doing? We doing all right? All right. Hey, we made it to the end of our season, the end of our series. I'm excited to welcome those that are watching online, uh, especially our uh, Rescue House North family. Can we welcome in our Rescue House North family all the way up in Boston, Massachusetts? We love you guys. We're so glad that you're tuning in. Hey, a couple of announcements before uh, we jump into today's message. Like you saw in the video, next week is our big chilling grill. This is our moment of fellowship. Really want to just personally invite you uh, to come out at that at the community park next uh, Sunday at 4 p.m. Um, I'll be there. Our staff's going to be there. Everybody's going to be there. So we want you to be there to come and play some games and just an awesome time of uh, free food and fellowship. Uh, Secondly, I wanted to let you know that we are experiencing um, a lot of growth here at Rescue House in many different ways. So not just numerically, but we're seeing it spiritually in brotherhood and sisterhood and in our small groups and in Rise Up ministry and in our kids' house ministry. Um, And we are experiencing growth numerically. Now, as we kind of study this and have looked at this um, uh, from churches that are ahead of us and, you know, just even being a part of this for 15 years, uh, we know that once an experience gets to be about 80% full, uh, people stop coming. And I don't, you know, there are a lot of different reasons as to why maybe that is, uh, but I've experienced that, so I believe that that is true. And so we're experiencing that in this first experience. You know, today it's about, you know, 85, 90% full in past uh, experiences like Mother's Day, Easter, um, and even some other experiences, it's been over 100% full where we're adding chairs, which is an awesome problem, and uh, we give God praise for that. Uh, But we need to kind of make a pivot and a little bit of a shift to make sure that we're making room uh, for more people, and we're making room to be able to share the gospel with as many people that want to come and be a part of what God is doing here at Rescue House. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make a a shift for the summer, uh, and we are going to go to summer experience times, and those summer experience times are going to be at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m., and our worship experiences will be one hour long, and we're going to try this for June and July, uh, hoping that maybe some of you will choose to attend the 10.30 and even it out a little bit um, and and help us uh, with that um, and free up more space uh, for people that maybe want to come to this experience. So I'm super excited about that. That's actually going to happen. Not next week. Next week is Memorial Day weekend, but the following weekend on Sunday, June the 2nd. So on Sunday, June the 2nd, our worship experience times for the summer in June and July are going to move to 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m., all right? And so hopefully we'll kind of see how that happens, see what happens there, and we'll make adjustments um, as, as needed. Now today... We're going to talk about the Tenth Commandment. Uh, Turn to somebody, give a turn to somebody next to you, give them a back high five, and tell them we made it. We made it. We made it all the way through. We're here, and you're here at the conclusion. And um, you know, hey, we're gonna we're gonna run. It feels like a marathon, doesn't it? You know, and you're just at the end of the marathon. You see the finish line, and so come on, somebody, I'm gonna run through the tape today for you, and I'm hoping to preach a message that's gonna be encouraging to you. I love that the Ten Commandments is not just a list of rules and regulations. Like, I hope that you have uh, been able to gain a new perspective of the Ten Commandments, that it's not, again, rules and regulations, but they're guardrails uh, to protect us uh, and to allow us to embrace the promises that God has for us. And and so they really are, at the heart of it, they are a reflection of God's character and a reflection of how we are uh, to, to live our lives and conduct our affairs. And I just think it's awesome that we have a God that has not left us in the dark, uh, that he has given us his word. Amen. Anybody love God's word? I mean, I just love his word. You know, the psalmist says about God's law, oh, how I love your instruction. It is my meditation all day long. And so I just want to encourage you just to fall more in love with God's word. And as you do that, I mean, I tell people the more tattered and tethered the word of God is in your life, 
life, the less tattered and tethered your life will be. And I truly believe that because God's guardrails uh, keep you from a life of, uh, of pain. And not saying that there won't be times of pain even as you follow Jesus. I mean, we see that in Jesus himself as he follows his will, but a lot of unnecessary pain that you don't need to get into if you'll be obedient to the word of God. And so today we're going to talk about the 10th commandment, which is do not covet. Do not covet. Exodus 27 says this right here. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey. Is anybody like, uh, okay, like you, you just ever looked out and go, man, I really want my neighbor's donkey. Like you ever done that? Or <laughs> anything else that belongs. So he just kind of puts everything in there. Anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The Greek word is epithemeo, and it means this, to set your heart upon, to long for, to covet, a desire, lust. This is the word right here. But I want to dive a little bit deeper because the word covet doesn't necessarily just mean desire, and we're going to talk about that. Coveting is actually this, the uncontrolled desire to acquire, okay? So it becomes a, a longing for that you cannot control uh, and you have no, uh, you know, uh, self-control. You don't have the fruit of the Spirit. And it's like you set your eyes on it and you want it so bad that you can't help yourself. You're going to go after it no matter what it costs, no matter if you have to stab somebody in the back, no matter if you have to cut corners or you have to go about it the wrong way. Uh, it's an uncontrolled desire to acquire. The word covet in Greek, you can actually look in a little bit deeper, and it, and it kind of gives this idea that you're, you're wanting to grasp something so tightly uh, that, you, that you're not willing to let go of it. And it's almost like if God ever gives you anything in your life and then tells you to give it away and you can't because you've grasped it so tightly in your life, then you don't own it, it owns you. I actually read an article one time about how um, uh, these hunters would hunt monkeys in the jungle and in the wild. And what they would do is they would actually set up coconut traps um, in the trees that look like coconuts and they would drill a hole uh, the size for them to be able to, the, the monkeys for them to be able to get their hand into it. And what they would do is they would put pieces of fruit, apple inside the, the coconut sized trap. And so the monkey would actually have enough room in the hole to put his hand through it, right, and grab the fruit that's in it. But once he would grab it tightly, then he no longer could bring his hand out of the coconut trap. And the monkey passionately so, so desired the fruit that was in there that they would not let go. And so all, the, all the, the hunters would have to do is just come up uh, and they would just take the monkey and that's how they would capture them in the wild. And the monkey, all he would have to do yeah. is let go. Yeah. And if the monkey would let go, then he would experience freedom. And that describes a lot of us. There are certain things in our life that God does not want for us. That we are not to, even though we might have a desire for them, God says no, we reach out, we grab a hold onto it, and because we're not able to let it go, it leads to bondage, it leads to, to chains, and it leads ultimately to our death and our capture of the enemy. Some places where this word is used in, in other parts of Scripture, the, the word that's used for covet, epithemeo, Matthew 5, 28, when Jesus says, everyone looks at a woman with lust, that word right there is the same word that he used for covet. So it's your longing for someone who is, is not yours. It's your, your, you know, your, your neighbor's husband, your neighbor's wife. So you look, lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Another place is Luke 15, 16, where it says he longed to eat. So this is from the prodigal son. He longed to eat uh, his fill from what the pigs ate. So the prodigal son's looking at what the pigs are eating, and he's, and he's coveting and longing for what the pigs were eating. Now, you need to understand that the gateway to coveting is comparison, so you, you've got to understand this. And like, listen, in America, we all do this. 
<laughs> we, we do. We, we all kind of can, if we're not careful, the gravitational pull is to compare, which ultimately leads to coveting. You walk into somebody's house, and the first thing you start doing unintentionally, you look at the floors, and you go, man, these are nice floors. I wish I had those in my house. Or you look at the blinds, or you look at the drapes, or you look at the television that's on the wall, or maybe you're just walking by somebody, and you're just having a bad hair day, and you notice their hair, and you're like, man, their hair looks legit. Like, I wonder who, like, fixed that, or what did they do to it? And you're like, my hair looks like you know, terrible today, um, and we begin to compare. Social media has ramped this up, and everybody on social media puts their stage performance out there for everybody to see. Come on, nobody's put posting their behind the scenes, right? And so what we do, uh, again, when we got to get a better perspective, is we compare our behind the scenes with everybody else's stage performance, with everybody else's best, and then it causes us to go down a path of coveting and wanting what we think somebody else has, but they really don't have. What we really want is the joy of the Lord, amen? Come on, we want the peace of God that passes all understanding. You gotta want that stuff, and that stuff isn't found on people's stage performance on social media. It's not. You're not gonna find it. And so you've got to learn to admire without having to acquire. If you're smart, you'd write that down. You don't, want to, you don't want to get into a place where like you're just always desiring what somebody else has. It wasn't too long ago that my boys played on a basketball team at CP3 Academy, and, and their coach uh, was a well-known restaurant owner in the Piedmont Triad who owns uh, a multiple amount of restaurants. I mean, if I started naming them, you would, may even know who this person is, or you would definitely know their, their restaurants, and you would have eaten there. And so I didn't really know uh, much about him, but um, he invited us over uh, to his house for practice, like to have practice at his house. And I'm thinking, what kind, what kind of house are we going to, all right? And so like literally I pull up to this house and it's got like a gate, like a, like a throne gate, somebody, okay? You know, I'm talking about Beverly Hills. This is what you see on TV and stuff like that. So of course I pulled out my, my camera. I'm like, I am filming this because I ain't never been, I've never seen this. Like, your boy grew up in a trailer park, yo. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm coming, you know. And so I get it out, and we make, like, the little phone call, and it just, like, the royalty just, like, opens up. And I'm like, oh. And, uh, and we're just, like, slowly going. And I got my, I, I didn't bring the video. I probably should have brought the video. But I, but I, and so we pull in, and it's like got its own cul-de-sac, and, like, just this one house. And we pull up, and there is a $250,000 Lamborghini with another $100,000 car parked right behind it. And so, like, I'm, I'm not, like, all into that, but I was kind of like, this is going to be legit. This is going to be, like, okay. And so, like, we come, he come meets us out here, and we go to the back, and there's, like, this pool, and then he takes us to the full-length basketball court that he had. This is where we're having practice. My boys are having practice. And then in the back, he's got a full-on tennis court, and like, and I'm just looking around, and he's got people working over here, he's got the landscapers over here, and he's like talking to them, and like, I mean, it is just like, it, it blew my mind, okay? This is like something you see on MTV Cribs, anybody? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Am I taking somebody back? Some of the older, older people are like, what's that? Oh, well, it was a show about big houses and stuff like this, and and, and, and the first part was like admiring like what's going on. And then as I kind of began to take it all in and like all the work that it would take to like keep this place up and how he, I mean, he had probably three different contractors from three different places of business working and, you know, doing all this stuff. Like I just remember leaving going, wow, that is awesome, but I don't want that. And, and we have to get to a place where we, we can admire and go, wow, that's cool, and that's, but mm. It's not for me. I want what the Lord has for me. Because as you mature in Christ, you realize that no happiness can be found in a $250,000 car. That's right. Come on. And that it can't be found in a house like that. And so, like, I've come to understand, you know, where I am. And you've got to understand this principle. You don't have to own it to enjoy it. Like, just get you some friends that own it. You know what I'm saying? I mean... <laughs> 
Like you like to go to the mount, you like to go to the mountains. You like a mountain house. Like find a friend and let, let you borrow it, right? <laughs> Or maybe just rent it for like one week out of the year. I think we, we get in this place where we feel like we, gotta, we have to own it to enjoy it. No, you don't. No, you don't. Uh, you can get creative. Um, I think about, um, I feel like she's kind of my adoptive grandma. She lives in Chapel Hill, and um, I've had a chance to you know, baptize um, almost all of her children and grandchildren. And so she looks at me like a little... You know, like I'm her, like I am a grandchild to her, and she owns this, you know, Myrtle Beach, you know, you know, little house on the, in this, you know, uh, park, and she lets us, lets me and my kids, we we get to enjoy it every year for for one week, um, and so the Lord sometimes blesses you when you like just are contented to with where you are. Sometimes He'll give you friends and He'll give you relationships that allow you to enjoy things that certainly that maybe you don't own. And so you don't have to own it to enjoy it. Now, the 10th commandment, I want to be very clear here, does not forbid you to have desires for certain things uh, or even demand satisfaction. God is not saying in the 10th commandment that you should never have a desire for something. That's not Christianity. Desires of themselves are not Wrong. In fact, your desires actually come from God. It's when your desires become uncontrolled that it becomes coveting. So when you desire something that's not yours, that's evil, uh, and that desire is a negative thing. Let me show you some places where it's okay to desire. First Timothy 3, 1 says, If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. So somebody who desires to maybe be an elder of a church or a pastor, you know, that's a, a good desire. That's an example of a good desire. Hebrews 6, 11 says, our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts. Luke twenty two fifteen 15 says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, and so this is Jesus saying, hey, I, I desire to have fellowship with you, and, um, and, and so I, I want you to know that, you know, biblical contentment is being joyful, at peace, and grateful to God in your present reality as you long for a better future reality. So, so as long as you're joy filled, right? Like, and you've got a peace, and you're and you're grateful to God what He's given to you, and and you're okay with that, and you're contented, then it's okay for you to long for something better or a future reality. Amen. Nothing can be accomplished unless you desire first to do it. You can't even become more like Christ unless you desire to be more like. Christ. You can't become more of a loving person unless you desire to love people well. You can't become more, a more generous person unless you desire to be a more generous person. So desire in and of itself is not bad. It's only when it becomes uncontrolled and you think, I want more and I want more. And the root of, of that kind of desire is comparing yourself to other people. And you can't have a contented life until you learn not to compare and you're okay with what God has given you. And you should never compare yourself to someone else because comparing always leads or mostly leads to coveting. So it's okay to want things in your life. And the 10 commandment is actually a little bit of encouragement because I think some of us misunderstand that and we think do not covet just simply means God's just saying just be happy with what you got. You ever said that as a parent? Just be grateful for what you got. Don't ask for anything else, right? But that's actually not the Lord. Um, the Lord is happy when his children come to him and, and ask, if they're, especially if there are desires that are according to his will and to his word. And so it's, it's, it's okay to want things. Here, here's a couple big ideas today, okay? It's okay to want things, but do not want the wrong things. That's what it means to, to, to covet is when we're, what he's talking about is we're coveting things that God doesn't want us to want and that we shouldn't want and, and that are wrong to want. Let me tell you a story about Timmy. Timmy was a single guy. He had a lot of good things going on for him. He was hoping to find a wife one day, and he just, you know, he, he's been kind of keeping up with his business, running some errands, and, 
He just kind of find him, found himself at the grocery store and he's kind of eating healthy because he's trying to keep himself in shape because, you know, he's trying to find a wife, right? So he's trying to present himself well and he looks over and he sees this woman who's in, you know, the veggie aisle and he, you know, she's kind of, I would never be there by the way, um, but Timmy is and he's, uh, you know, uh, watching her and she's kind of picking out carrots and she's like, wow, like, you know, she's living a healthy life and then he sees that she's like really, really beautiful and he, he, and he just has this moment where he's just like starstruck. Maybe some of you have been there and he's just, he thinks to himself in his mind, it pops in his brain, I think this is a girl in my dreams. All right, and I found her at the grocery store, all right? And so then he starts, like, imagining, like, oh, my goodness, like, I think I want to marry this girl. Like, I think I, this could be it, right? Like, I at least want to just ask her out on a date, see where she's at. Um, and he gets kind of a little bit carried away, like, you know, maybe he, you know, he, he, he does. And, um, and, and so then he gets up enough courage, to, like, I'm going to go ask her out. I'm going to go talk to her. And he comes around the corner, and just as he does it, bam. He sees she has a wedding ring. And the girl of his dreams, right, has been spoken for. And before he noticed her, you know, he noticed she was attractive and um, obviously he got a little bit carried away. And, but from this point forward, he now has a choice. Yes. Wanting her from this point forward would be coveting another man's wife. And so he's got a choice. He can either say, you know, my bad, you know, I didn't realize it and walk away. Or he can say, well, what's, what's, what's harm, harming a little flirting, you know, like maybe I just like bump into her. Oh, I didn't see you there, you know. Or, um, you know, hey, can you pass me the carrots and, you know, try to start a, you know, conversation like that. And, you know, one thing lead to another. Or... And it's like you want that thing. But it's another thing to want something that's not right for you. And it's another man's wife. It's always wrong to want another man's wife. It's always wrong to want another woman's husband. Is it wrong to want a husband? No. But it's wrong to want another woman's husband. It's always wrong to want to find sexual satisfaction with someone you're not married to. And people will say, well, it just kind of feels right, or, or this person, you know, just disregard everything that God would, would say in his word, and this person makes me happy, and so I'm just going to disregard it. I don't care if it's another person's, you know, spouse or whatever. I don't care what the situation, circumstance, they make me happy, and God does not care to make you happy. He wants you to be holy. And so people will say, well, I just, you know, I feel a certain way. And, and, and you know, I just got to go with my heart on this one. Or I'm just going to follow my heart. Or this is the big one that the enemy has lied and roped a lot of people into and, and, they, and has carried them out to a life of sin and a life of death. And it's this right here. I just need to be true to myself. Right. And that phrase right there. It has got the enemy written all over it. Because the problem is, is you and I, we are sinners. And when we are true to ourselves, then it means we're following ourselves. It means we are the king of our lives and we do what we want to do. And that always leads you to death. Amen. Always. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately Sick. So if you got a you know girlfriend in your circle, it's like, girl, follow your heart. You need to get rid of her. Seriously. Your heart will trick you. The devil will deceive you. Yeah. And you can talk yourself into a manner of all kinds of crazy things in the name of just be true to yourself. Or I, I just, I, this is, these are my feelings. And I've told you before and I've preached this before, your feelings aren't facts. This is what we want to build our life on, amen? amen? On the facts and the word of God that is true. Right. You build your life on your feelings, and it's like building your house on the sand. When the rains come, the storms come, your house is going to crumble. And I don't want that for you. The reality is, is you've got a sinful nature, I've got a sinful nature, 
Sometimes you think being true to your, you know, I'm being true to myself, but actually you're being true to what the devil wants for you, which again leads you away from God's best in your life, which is why we have to take all of our feelings and submit them to God and filter them through the word of God. You know, some things you're just, as a follower of Jesus, you're not allowed to do. You're just not, you're not allowed to do it. No matter how much you desire it, no matter how, how much you want it, the world says you deserve to be happy. The world says be true to yourself. The world says follow your heart. But God says that there are things in this life that you are not to have, that I don't want you to take a hold of. Or the answer is just simply no. And God isn't saying no because he's trying to be a, you know, a hard father to take your fun card away from you. He's saying no because he wants to protect you from something that will hurt you. We see this example in Genesis 3 when we talk about creation and the garden and Adam and Eve, and we see this account. Let's read it in Genesis 3. One day the, ser the serpent asked the woman, did God really say? And that's what the enemy, you know, the enemy doesn't have a new phrase that he likes to come up with. Like he is still whispering this into many of your lives, into your hearts. Did God really say that if you lust in your heart after somebody, is it, like, is that, did God really say that's like the same? I mean, did God really say, you know, and then fill in the blank? That's the man, that's the enemy's greatest line. And he says it to, to Eve, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. So there's one thing that they're not allowed. They can have everything else. But the one thing God has told them not to eat, God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. And then the serpent comes along, oh, you, you're not gonna die. They're like, did God really say, like, come on, you don't really believe that, right? And the serpent replied to the woman. The woman was convinced she saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted, and that word wanted right there is the same word as covet. She wanted, she desired the wisdom that, in other words, she wanted to, she wanted to be God. She wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. What did she, she wanted and desired the wrong thing thing. So she took some of it, her husband took some of it, and then they ushered sin into the world. Their eyes were open, they felt shame and nakedness for the first time. And why did this happen? Because they didn't listen to God. <clears throat> they listened to the lies of the enemy who said, did God really say? It's the first thing the enemy, is, that's why you gotta know God's word. You gotta know, and this has gotta be your foundation. Same thing happened to David, a man after God's own heart. We talked about this a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago when we talked about uh, do not steal. When David looks out, he see, sees Bathsheba, and, and, and he, 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 he begins to have a desire to acquire her. The husband's off at, at war, and he begins to, you know, begin to desire her. That desire leads into uh, intimacy. The intimacy leads to her being pregnant, her being pregnant leads to him scheming to kill her husband. And you just, can you just see like how it starts small, right? And it's like that casting crown song, it's a slow fade. Yeah. I mean, it starts very small, but the, the, the enemy just kind of, the enemy's not gonna come right out and just like, you know, yeah. lie, like he's gonna start very small. Did God really say that? Let's like plant a seed, like a little, little hint right here, and then just, and then he's just gonna build it over time. And as you, eventually you become convinced, and you're so far away from what God's word is that now you fall into a life of sin. That's why, listen to me, when there is sin in your life, you gotta kill it Amen. when it's small. That's why I tell you I want to talk about comparison because if you can kill it at the comparison stage, then it'll never get to the coveting stage. So kill it before it is 
It gets, because it begins to grow and grow and grow and it gets worse and more pain and more harm and all along the way, the Holy Spirit is there trying to convict you like, hey, stop. But like, we're like those little children like, la, 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 I can't hear you, you know? <laughs> and we just kind of do what we want to do. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, how did I get here? How did I get in this place? Well, it's because you ignored the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then oftentimes I've been, in, I've been doing this a long time to, to know that people get to that place and then you know who they blame? God. Like it's God's fault. Like it's God the one that was disobedient. Like God was the one that moved. No. You over time begin to allow the enemy's lies to seep into your heart. Started with comparison, moves to coveting, moves to actually living that out and now you're in a place that you never thought that you would be and so you gotta kill it when it's small, maybe the Holy Spirit is convicting you today because you've been wanting something that's wrong for you, something that's not right, that's off limits, that you know you shouldn't want. Maybe you thought it looked good, maybe it felt good, but right now God is showing you that it is not good and you have a choice. Are you gonna repent or are you going to persist? And the Holy Spirit right now is, is telling some of you it's time to repent and to not move any, any more toward that thing that you desire. Can I just encourage you? You won't ever go wrong trusting and obeying God's word. You will never regret trusting and obeying God's word. So when God says it's not good, trust him, repent, and move forward. The 10th commandment is also telling us this, do not want the right things in the wrong way. You know, it's possible for you to want things that are of God, but you go about it in the wrong way, and when you do that, it is wrong. Let me tell you another story about Johnny. Johnny uh, grew up poor, Um, he was broke, Didn't have a a lot growing up. Money was always kind of an issue. He never had enough. There were always fights. There were always bills piling up. And so he thought to himself, when he got older, he was going to work hard and he wasn't going to, you know, he was going to raise his kids differently. He wasn't going to stress about money. He was going to make sure he had a house and had the cars and, 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 and had a good life for himself. And, and somewhere along the line, his desire for wealth kind of began to spin out of control. And so he began to dabble into gambling and to sports betting and, you know, lottery tickets and, and, and dreaming about stress striking it rich, and um, he wasn't happy living just kind of paycheck to paycheck, and so he kind of starts gambling. That turns into risky investments and, you know, buying, you know, cryptocurrency and and trying to leverage that, and um, next thing you know, like, you know, um, stock markets crashed, uh, the cryptocurrencies went out of control, and uh, now he's got a lot of taxes that's built up that he hasn't paid, and so they start to come for him. He gets in trouble, and he, you know, loses everything that he's earned and more, and, <clears throat> and now he's back on the streets, and he's worse off than he ever started before. Now, the problem wasn't that he, that he wanted something that was not good. He, he desired something that was okay, Something that was good to make a good living, to provide for his family. He wanted to be comfortable. He wanted to have a few nice things. No big deal, right? But he wanted it and went about it the wrong way. Nothing, it's not wrong to to desire to have resources and to have things and even to have money. It's wrong when those things have you. 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10 says, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's that desire and that that love, that uncontrolled uh, desire to acquire money and wealth and riches that is the root of all kinds of evil. And when you love something that you're not supposed to love, it always leads you into pain. Let me give you some more examples. Maybe you're at work and you're dreaming of climbing the corporate ladder and you wanna get promoted and you want your boss's office, right? 
not necessarily wrong to want to get promoted and move up the corporate ladder, but if you're willing to stab other people in the back in order to get there, then that's when it becomes wrong. It's actually good to want sexual satisfaction. That is not a bad thing. That is in our DNA. We are made in the image of God, and God has instilled that want inside of us, and so that's okay, but it's wrong when you go outside of God's design to desire it or acquire it. You understand? It's good to want to be friends with your children, but not at the expense of being a parent first. It's good to want relief from heartbreak and pain and sadness, but not if you're willing to use illegal substances to numb the pain. And so there there are situations and circumstances and examples of wanting something that's good, but you want it in the wrong way, and that becomes wrong and it becomes sinful. I'll say it like this, and you can write this down. Pursuing the right thing the wrong way or or pursuing the right thing the wrong way is wrong. Wanting the right thing for the wrong reasons is wrong. So you can want some good things, but for the wrong reasons. Like, Like it's a good thing to wanna be physically fit, to make sure I'm eating healthy and make sure I got, you know, uh, a, a good body, you know, when, you know, the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's good to be healthy. It's good to be physically fit. But if you're doing it to increase your odds of, of hooking up with somebody, then that's for the wrong reasons. It's good to want financial stability. But if you're dreaming of financial stability so that you can become lazy when you get it and not do anything for the kingdom of God, well, again, that's the wrong motivation. James 4, 2 and 3 says this, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it from them. And I think if we're all being honest, to some level, we have struggled with this. We've struggled with wanting something we shouldn't want or wanting something good, but maybe for the wrong reasons and We pursued it in the wrong way because we haven't really learned to be content. We haven't learned to be content. Hear me on this. Contentment is not a gift of the Spirit. Like, like nobody has the gift of contentment because contentment is something you have to learn. It's something you have to educate yourself on it. Philippians 4, Paul says this from a prison for, floor, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need or know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now, contentment does not mean that I can't long for what's ahead or have a desire for what's ahead. In fact, Hebrews eleven sixteen 16 says this, but now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. And this is speaking of Christians who know that they have a promised inheritance from God. And I'm content with where God has me. I'm grateful for what God has me. There's a joy uh, in my life, right? There's a peace that passes all understanding, but I know and I'm looking forward to my heavenly home. And there is a desire there for that. Let me close with what I think is one of the craziest stories in all of the Bible. In fact, it's just kind of mind-blowing that this actually went down. This is in Genesis 25, 29, and 34, and it's the story of Jacob and Esau. Really lean into this. I don't want you to miss this, okay? And I'll, and I'll get you out of here in about five minutes. It says, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, so Jacob's just kind of, you know, I guess preparing for the chili cook-off or something. It says, Esau arrived from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. And can I just stop right there and just let you know that you should never make any type of big decision or really even any decision when you are exhausted and hungry or depressed, or full of anxiety. Like, those are not good seasons to make big decisions. So here comes Esau, home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. 
give me some of that red stew. Didn't even say please or nothing. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. So moving on, verse 31. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Can you believe that? That's crazy. So his brother comes home, he's like, man, that stew smells so good, I'm exhausted from being in a, you know, can I just have, can I have that bowl of stew? And his brother's like, yeah, give me your birthright, because Esau was born first. You give me your birthright, I'll give you this small little bowl of stew. It like seems like a crazy trade. Like who in the world would trade their birthright for a bowl of stew? He says, look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. And then he begins to think to himself, what good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. And he showed contempt In other words, he despised his rights as the firstborn. Now, in ancient times, it was like amazing to be born first. We got any firstborn kids in here? You were like the firstborn? Yeah. Y'all get some perks that we secondborns don't get, okay? Like there are like a thousand more photos of you than people (laughs) like me. I don't know. By the time you get to the baby of the, you know, it's like there's nothing, right? It's almost like they stopped caring or something. But being born first in ancient times, check it out. Here's what you got if you were the firstborn. You were the religious leader of your family. You are the one that got to offer sacrifices to God, experiencing his presence in in a special way. And then this, this is the kicker. As the firstborn, you got a double portion of your father's inheritance as the firstborn. You got twice as much as any of your Siblings, That's what you got as your birthright. So we read this story and we think, well, man, that's kind of like, like what kind of brother is Jacob, right? (laughs) Like taking advantage of his brother in a moment of, you know, weakness. Like that just doesn't seem like a very good brotherly thing to do. But did you know that in all of scripture, you won't find any part of scripture condemning Jacob for this moment? In fact, you will only find places like in Hebrews 12 where it says that Esau was godless and immoral. So this is not a story about Jacob tricking his brother. This is a story about Esau taking for granted what God had given to him, his birthright. And in a moment of weakness and in a moment of of hunger, willing to trade his birthright, really not for a bowl of stew, trade his birthright for anything. It's a slap in the face to God of saying, I don't care what you promise me. I want what I want right now. And in a moment, he makes this decision to trade all of that for a bowl of stew. So this story is about Esau not valuing the promise, blessing of his father because he was hungry and exhausted. Philippians 3 says this, they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they, they, they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we eagerly await are waiting for him to return as our savior. You know, some of you have set up wills for your your children. Um, If you haven't, I I haven't yet. Like that's something that Lauren and I kind of talk about and we need to to do that. And, And I imagine when I set up this will for my children, especially if we do this in the next couple months, you know, I've got a 10 year old, an eight year old and a six year old, right? Like, you think I'm gonna just leave my house to them like right now, like if we were to like pass away, like I'm gonna give a 10 year old a house and, and all of our inheritance? No. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the will up and I'm gonna, in, in the right timing that I think he can handle it or they can handle it. And in that season, I'm, he's, he's promised it, but it's gonna come at the right time, you understand? 
I'm here to tell you that your heavenly father has set up a will for you. And it's an already not yet promise. He's given it to you, but he's gonna give it to you in the right timing and in the right space and place that you can handle it. And so there's this idea that, okay, I've got what God promised me, and I know that like there's a future reality that I'm going to embrace it, but it's in that meantime, in between my present circumstance and what I'm seeing and the future reality of what God has promised me and what I know he's gonna give me and what he's spoken to me, it's in the middle and in the meantime that we start to allow the enemy to seep in and to speak lies into our life. It's in that gap of your present circumstances and God's promise where you find yourself hungry, desperate, and scared. And that's when you start to think, well, maybe it's okay if I cheat to get ahead. Maybe it's okay if I marry a non-Christian or you know, he's got some redeeming qualities and he's got some potential. And Maybe it's okay to have some companionship outside of marriage. And, you know, what's it really gonna hurt? And we start to doubt, can God really come through for me? And, or has God forgotten me? And, and then that's when the enemy comes along and says, did God, did God really say that he had that in store for you you sure starts getting you to doubt so maybe you should just kind of take a nibble over here and just kind of do your thing over here do what you want just are you kind of feeling that just go with your feelings and just trust your heart and be true to yourself and you're in that place of vulnerability where the devil steps in and and he offers you a trade and a sloppy substitute for the gift that God has for you. And if you'll remain faithful, church, come on, I'm asking you, remain faithful to God's word. Build your life on God's love and on God's word. He's faithful to deliver your inheritance for you. It's gonna be in the right timing though. He knows when you can handle it. He knows when you can receive it. And it's a good and perfect gift. But you gotta remain faithful today. You gotta remain faithful, obedient to God's word. I come to tell you, don't trade your divine birthright for a demonic consolation prize. Don't. I know we're all in the meantime right now. We're in the middle. A lot of us, we've been saved, you know, years ago. And and then our present future, our home in heaven, what we're desiring is, is down the road. And we're in the middle. We're in the meantime. Don't let the devil lie to you. Seep in your heart and get you to desire things that God doesn't want for you or to desire things that maybe look good, but you're doing them in the wrong way. Don't do it. Be faithful and obedient to God's word. You know, in the Bible, our heavenly father is described approximately 25 times as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you realize that before, before this moment that he traded his birthright, it was supposed to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But Esau gave that up because he took for granted what God had given to him and because he was not living in contentment and because he did not trust God for his future inheritance. Let's learn from Esau. Let's learn from his mistake. Don't trade your inheritance. Don't trade your birthright. Don't trade what God has for you for anything of this world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you're doing in our church. God, we love your word. God, we stand on your word. We build our families on your word. God, we want to be a church that's obedient to your word, disciples that are fully devoted to you, God. I pray that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. You would snuff out the enemy's lies. 
God, if there's anybody in here right now that is desiring the wrong thing, God, I pray you would take that desire away from them. God, that you would send somebody in their life to speak your word. God, I pray they would get in your word. God, anybody that's desiring good things but in the wrong way, God, I pray that you would uh, just convict them. God, I pray that they would repent and they would not persist in moving forward. God, we ultimately thank you for these guardrails, these 10 commandments and that are so life-giving that, that are not restrictive, but they give freedom to your children. We give you honor, we give you praise, we give you glory for your instruction. We love your instruction, God. God, let it be our meditation. Father, we thank you for this season and this series. God, I pray that we continue to build our lives upon your word and, and on the shoulders of the Ten Commandments. God, that we would not forget this season, that this would be a season that would mark us and, and would forever change us. So we love you, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, church. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.